Okay, our guest today is Trevor Bauer. Uh, uh, we've had some good guests in our uh, Sabermetrics course this semester, and definitely this is this is a highlight. Who knew we'd have a chance to interview uh, you know such an analytically oriented player so close to the when the regular season should be starting. Uh, so we got to look for the uh, bright spots here in things. So uh, here's my first question, just to get things rolling. How about, uh, is it fun to be back in the National League with the opportunity to hit? <laughs> I hate hitting. Um, I used to joke with my dad when I was in Little League that uh, I was in an eight-year slump, but I was only eight years old at the time. Um, so I just, yeah, I've never, I've never been good at it. I've never enjoyed it. I always like, I like pitching. And I like playing defense. That was always, always what I enjoyed. So, uh, actually, you know, it's, it's better to be in the American league for me because I don't get taken out of the game prematurely for a pinch hitter. Uh, so I get to, I get to throw 110 or 120 pitches every game, regardless of the score. Okay. So before everything started to get shut down, you put on a Sandlot game to raise money for stadium workers, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So uh, we've gotten the news that uh, spring training was postponed and, um, you know, the CDC had talked about uh, gathering sizes of 50 or um, 50 or less as was the recommendation at the time. And a good buddy of mine, David Carpenter, who's uh, in camp at the Reds at the time, sent out a tweet saying, hey, we should get to, we should get the guys together in a field and just you know, play a sandlot game. Um, kind of going back to how we came up in baseball, you know, you'd show up to a tournament and some random park and you'd play and that was the fun of it. So it sounded like a great idea. I talked to my guys uh, at Momentum and we decided that we'd be able to, to cover it and, and make it happen. So we started out doing it. It was originally supposed to be a baseball game, but then the commissioner jumped in and started threatening to cancel everybody's contracts if they played in it or whatever. And so we made a wiffle ball game. We played a little game over the line, which is, I don't know if everybody is familiar with that one, but when you're young and you only have five or six guys going out to play baseball, you play over the line. So you don't have to cover the whole field defensively. And, um, yeah, we had, we had a good time with it. Uh, Miracle League of Arizona did a really a really good thing for us. They, you know, opened up their facilities to have us out there and play on a field that had some fences and was, you know, baseball as baseball-esque as possible. And, um, you know, playing in front of in front of no fans, even though it was just a wiffle ball game, there was no fans there. And I don't remember the last time any of us had ever, had ever played in a stadium, anything remotely like baseball, where there wasn't a larger group of fans there watching. Uh, and so it kind of just drove home the point of uh, that, you know, the stadium workers are the ones who allow the fan experience to happen. You know, they clean the stadium, they man the, the aisles, they tell you where your seats are, they run the, uh, the screening and stuff coming into the ballpark to make sure everybody's safe. They're uh, the concession stands, all the different things that you kind of take for granted when you go to a game that make a game uh, possible. Uh, the people that put that on now are, you know, there's no games. A lot of them are seasonal hourly employees and stuff. And they, um, they don't have they don't have a paycheck coming in, so I wanted to support those those people who take care of my family when they go to a game and who take care of the fans as a whole when they go to games. That's cool. So one of the things, just kind of continuing down the same same thread, a big part of Xavier's mission is to uh, teach students to be men and women for others. Uh, can you talk about your sixty nine days of giving plan and how that got started and give us a little yeah? So that? it actually <clears throat> yeah. So it started off with uh, some frustration with. Um, the team and, and how things were going and uh, in the arbitration, um, I guess, negotiation period. And so I just found a, I found a way to turn that uh, frustration into something that could help serve others. And um, I think that's one of the better ways to, to go about frustration is to find ways to think about people outside of your shoes and how they're perceiving things or what they're going through. And most times when you do that, your struggles and your frustrations seem to be minimized. Uh, so yeah, just wanted to kind of take that, uh, take that chance to, to start up and help, to, um, help as many people as possible. And so I'm, I have a kind of an interesting backstory. I'm a nerd for sure, first and foremost, uh, but I'm also an athlete obviously. And so growing up, I didn't have, I didn't really have a peer group. You know, I didn't have, I didn't fit in with the nerds cause I was an athlete and I didn't fit in with the athletes cause I was a nerd. And so I ended up with a, a very minimal, if, you know, if any, uh, amount of people in my peer group. So I would go in at lunch at school and play chess or do calculus homework or something like that with a couple other people that were, that were in the class. And so I have this really big affinity for 
kids, uh, like after school programs for kids to, to encourage them to do the things that they love, but uh, to do them, uh, you know, in a setting where they can develop a peer group doing them. So that could be robotics, it could be chess, it could be uh, uh, music, it could be coding, it could all these different things, soccer, athletics, whatever the case is. And so the majority of my efforts have um, have been to to help. Uh, support those after-school programs or those clubs that make these activities possible for kids, uh, as well as trying to crowdsource it. So it, it's impossible for me to find all the great organizations around the country that are doing really good work you know, on things like this, on uh, with after-school programs and helping kids in, in the local communities. So we opened it up to uh, recommendations from fans uh, that follow me on Twitter and Instagram to put in their favorite organization or an organization that has helped their kids or people that they know. And I, I really like that way of doing it because uh, it gets the community involved even more and draws awareness to the causes. So hopefully outside of the awareness that I draw to them and the money that I'm able to donate to them, they get more awareness from the surrounding community that their organization exists and hopefully that allows them to help more people. Nice. Um, so you're known as a very analytically oriented player. Tell us kind of what got you started down that path. <clears throat> Yeah, so my dad uh, was actually a chemical engineer. Um, and so growing up, he taught me the engineering process uh, from day one, basically. Where are you? Where do you want to go? How are you going to get there? And then iterate. Uh, so when I wanted to learn how to hit, it was like, okay, well, what do we want? What are we trying to learn? Let's develop some drills that might teach us that. Uh, let's evaluate. Is it working? Is it not? Uh, and then you, know, you go through the process again. It didn't work with hitting, but it worked with pitching, defense. It worked with academics, stuff like that. Um, perhaps we just didn't have the right process on hitting or whatever the case is. But uh, I got the, I got engaged in that thought process from a very young age. And then uh, I had a AP physics class, a Newtonian physics class, my freshman year of high school with a man named Martin Kirby. Uh, he's a, a guy from... Uh, came from the UK, had a funny accent. The class was awesome. It's probably looking back, it's probably my favorite class that I ever had, uh, just because you know the, the professor made it so engaging and so interesting to me. And so after I, you know, basically during that year when I was learning these Newtonian physics concepts, I started trying to apply those to baseball. Um, okay, thinking about torque works and uh, leverage and momentum and stuff like this like okay well how do i make the baseball move this way or how do i make the baseball go faster or you know how can i maximize you know the energy in the body and the kinetic chain and so i just started off down that process and started researching it and then when i got out of school uh, i missed academics a lot i i didn't really have a a, a way that i could apply my love for academia in professional baseball. And so it, it took on this kind of research oriented form where in the off season I would try, you know, a bunch of different numbers and formulas or whatever, try to find a way to, to improve a skill. Um, uh, high speed cameras, uh, um, data analytics, saber metrics, like all that stuff, just at some point it plays a part in what you're doing. You know, how do I throw the pitch that I want to throw or when do I throw it? Or, you know, all these different things come into it. So that's been my process and it just kind of started and from a young age and grew as I moved up. Cool. So um, how did you get involved with Driveline? So, yeah, I met uh, Kyle in 2013. So Kyle's the founder. I met Kyle at a conference, um, a, a coach's conference, actually. So I attended the coach's conference to try to learn about some of the techniques that were out there and how coaches were going about uh, training their players and what techniques they were using. Uh, Kyle gave a presentation about really kind of theoretical stuff. Uh, hey, I, I, I might be able to put sensors on the arm to measure torques. I might be able to use high-speed video to do this. I might, you know, kind of the things, that, the things that he was thinking about doing, and I'd never heard someone speak about baseball in that way um so it was very interesting i didn't understand a lot of what he was saying it was over my head at the time uh a lot of it still is actually because it comes from a, a computer uh a coding background a computer science background but uh he had some clips in there of high speed 
um, he had some high speed video clips in his presentation. And I went up to him afterwards and I asked him what camera he was using. Cause at the time my dad and I were using some Casio handheld cameras that shot it up to a thousand frames per second. But as soon as you went to high speed, the write speed on the card, it would skip frames. It would drop frames. Um, I didn't know that it was the right speed on the card at the time. So I went up to him and I asked him what camera he was using. And he said the same camera I was using, the Casio XLM 100. Uh, I said, do you ever have this problem where it, you know, it skips frames and you get these jumps in the video and stuff? Because at the time, my dad and I had a setup of five cameras, one at home, one at second, one at third, one at first, and one directly overhead. And so but you had to hit record on them manually. So we'd have a ladder set up in the facility. So I would be on top of the ladder and I'd hit record up top. Uh, my dad would run around and hit record on all the four cameras and I would move the ladder really quick and grab a ball and try to throw a pitch before the cameras started skipping. And it was you know, this crapshoot because I would throw a really good pitch that I wanted to analyze, but then one of the cameras would skip. So the whole kind of three dimensional view was ruined. And so uh, I asked Kyle, and he said, yeah, I, I had that problem, but it's the right speed of the card. We were using class four cards at the time, and we needed a class 10. Uh, this is before the U system or whatever it is now, uh, the UH system, I think, on, on right speed of cards. But he solved that problem for me, and I was like, okay, that's immediate value that he's provided. And this theoretical stuff that I've never heard someone talk about, there's probably going to be value to that, so I need to keep in contact with this guy. So over 2013, I started... Uh, changing my delivery to uh, minimize injury risk and try to make myself a better player, but I was really struggling on how to actually go about moving the way that I wanted to move. It was a, a pretty drastic change. So I would communicate with Kyle a little bit throughout, throughout the season on some different ideas, and he basically said, look, in season, you can't really make any any changes, so you need to uh, you know, come up here after the off season. we can talk about it, or after the season, during the off season." And so I did. I went up there for four days and talked to him about the mechanical changes. He gave me some drills that I could do, explained things to me, and it actually it really helped uh, simplify the mechanical changes I was trying to make. And so after that, it was just, you know, this is this is where the value is. This is where I need to train. And so I've been going back ever since. Nice. So you're known for having a lot of different pitches. How much does analysis help you decide what to throw and when do you just need to just t tr trust your gut? Yeah, so that's a that's a really deep one. Um, over my over my history as a as a pitcher, I mean, dating back to you know when I was a kid, I would try a bunch of different grips. I would try to throw a ball, you know, pronated or supinated, or try to make it move this way or that way or whatever. So I had all these different grips that I tried, and um, there was no real rhyme or reason to it. It was just let me try this. Oh, that seemed to be good. Let me see if I can throw it uh, in a game, and then that kind of lasted through college, uh, or at least into college. And then in college, I started uh, reading some books by Perry Husband uh, about effective velocity. And a concept that was in there is tunneling and trying to get all your pitches to basically come out looking the same and then dart different directions. And so then that was the first time I really had an end goal with the pitches. It's like, okay, let me throw something that starts straight and moves different directions at different speeds. And that was kind of the rudimentary portion of it. And then uh, getting into pro ball, and um, then they had pitch effects at the time. And so I could quantify how my pitches were moving. And there's a certain, you know, you can create an XY coordinate system and plot w the movements of your different pitches and, you know, create where the, where the tunnel must have been for them all to start the same and then where they would end up at the plate. And then when we got TrackMan, that got a little bit more detailed. And TrackMan came along in 2015, I think, or 14. Uh, and so I was able to measure the actual movements of the pitches more accurately and the end, and the end location of it and the release point, and then it started quantifying the spin rate on it and the spin direction. And then at this time, we were starting to develop this, uh, the ability to pull that information off of an Edgertronic camera that my dad and I had bought uh, before anyone else had Edgertronic cameras. And so this, it just kind of, again, it just kind of built up and built up. And now it's to the point where I know exactly what, Actually, the, my analyst, my team of analysts, I, I employ uh, two full-time analysts and two part-time analysts um, that are going through and doing different data projects for me. But they're actually developing a system, a, a stuff score. Uh, so, so you look at your individual pitch, one pitch type, let's say a fastball, and you can compare it to all the other fastballs in the league on effectiveness. So you can get a, a grade of how good your fastball actually is. 
scouts used to do it. Oh, he's got a 60 grade fastball or an 80 grade fastball or whatever, but it was all just based off the eye test. Now we can quantify it. And then I throw six different pitch types so I can quantify all of them. And then they all have effects on each other. You know, if you throw a two seam and a slider, they, they play off of each other better than a four seam and a slider maybe, or whatever the case is. So now we can actually start saying, what do I need to change on an individual pitch type to make it play up in my arsenal as a whole? And once you have that piece, then you can start saying, what is the most effective time to throw each of these pitches in a game to a specific hitter? How does he perform against pitch types that are similar? How does he perform in situations where there's bases loaded in one out, bases loaded in two outs, nobody on and, and no outs? Like you can really get down to the nitty gritty of this. The end goal would be to have a game theory optimized algorithm basically calling the pitches with the most optimal pitch to take into account your ability to execute that pitch. No, no pitcher executes a pitch perfectly every time. Uh, very, very rarely. They miss the spots a lot. Uh, but no scouting reports currently take into account those missed tendencies. So one spot might be the best spot, but if the surrounding areas are negative or not as good, then your likelihood that you get into a, a situation where it's a negative pitch is higher. Uh, so these things need to be accounted for. So these are some of the things that are being worked through right now with my analysts and trying to develop uh, software and systems around them. Got it. So the analysts are like your analysts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, uh, um, yeah, I, I employ them personally. Yeah. So that's cool. That's cool. You know, we talk. Um, well, I guess this brings me to my next question: Do do your analysts ever bring you something that they're all excited about that maybe is hard for you to follow? And what I'm getting at here, and the question is, is 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 you know, we're talking to people who are going to do uh, data analytics, you know, whether it's for baseball or for business, how do we think as analysts about providing data to end users that, that is, that is useful? Yeah. Uh, the answer to your first question is all the time. And you know, they bring something in. I'm like, now what the heck is this? And the, the initial reaction is this is stupid. Right. But I know that my analysts are very smart and they have a reason behind what they're doing. And so I'm like, okay, let's get on a call. Explain to me, how this works and and why so the first thing is why did you develop this and then how does it work what are the steps so i can understand what's going on behind the, the scenes of it and then okay how do we use the output and so we walk through that process and then we i usually get to a place where i'm like there's an aha moment in the middle of the conversation where i'm like oh okay this isn't dumb at all this is really smart they're misguided in this little area or that area because they don't have the experience of being a professional pitcher and what's usable and what's not. But this direction is a really good direction to go down. Let's clean up this. Hey, we might not be able to go this direction exactly because of these things in the game, but we could go this direction instead. And so uh, the process then becomes, um, I know it experientially, primarily, and they know it numerically, primarily, and we have to blend those two together. So you have experience and you have numbers and, both of them matter uh, for the out for the end user. The end user has to be able to use the information, right? So if they don't understand it or if it's not usable in their line of work, then it doesn't it doesn't do any good, even though the analysis might be spectacular. You know, but if you only rely on experience and how things have been done, and you don't use the data, then you never innovate and you miss trends and you fall behind very quickly. So it's an important marriage of um, you know numbers and experience that that's necessary. What about graphs and visuals? I'm huge on graphs. So um, this is one thing that I actually go back and forth with. Can you send me a graph of showing this? I, I want this axis to be, uh, the, you know, spin rate, gross spin rate. And I want this axis to be miles per hour. And I want to see like, because I can see a, I can see a trend in the graph. Like, okay, I see. So as spin rate goes up, velocity goes up and I, okay, this is a, this, this makes sense to me. If you tell me that, you know, um, the R squared value is uh, 0.96 and uh, whatever. And it's linearly correlated. I'm like, okay, I, I can interpret that, but it, it doesn't, my brain doesn't work nearly as well with that information. I know it, I know what it means, but if I see it on a graph, like, oh yeah, I see it right there. That, that makes sense. Um, so graphs are really important. And the graphs are actually used a ton in, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier the XY uh, coordinate system for mapping your pitches, but that's how that's how the vast majority of data on pitch shapes uh, are displayed, and velocities too. 
uh, one of the most important things that we use is in game you have this you have a, a coordinate plot and you can see where your average let's let's say slider is your average slider is here and there's a cluster of dots but your slider today is over here and you can see intuitively oh my slider is moving more today than it was on average i probably should throw that more because it's it's really good today or man here's my cluster of fastball velocities but my fastball velocity is down here today uh i my fastball's way down uh, i need to adjust how i might use it so graphs are very uh, for me specifically they're very important to just get a very quick visual representation of yep okay i see what's going on i can process that super quick and then i'm on my way to to apply it so you work with other guys too i mean so from what i understand the, the rumor is that you're you're a big help in the clubhouse you're trying to help guys understand this. I try yeah well yeah. I mean you know I think there's some truth in rumors from what I understand but um what what how you know a lot of your teammates don't have the educational background or the interest that you do how do you communicate with them in a way that you share these analytical thoughts yeah so this is uh this is something that I'm not great at I'm, I've been trying over the past couple of years to get better at it because I'll explain something to someone like, oh yeah, well, uh, your knee needs to roll this way because then uh, set your hips in a 45 degree angle so that when you block on the front leg, the hips can rotate, it spikes, then the kinetic chain is timed correctly. And like, I'll go on this super accurately scientific explanation of exactly what's going on, but that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for what drill do I do to get better at it? You know, or, oh, I need to have my hand on the side of the ball. You could have just said that. Oh, shoot, you're right. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, and so this is actually one of the biggest things. This is the new arms race in baseball right now is what I like to call interpreters um, because data is a different language than experience. And so you have a lot of the front offices, they're operating in a data language. They know the track man numbers. They know the um, aging curves. They know the, the all this different stuff, the swing, um, the blast motion data. They know the Rapsodo data, all this different stuff. But the players don't understand it. They haven't been educated to understand it because it's still fairly new in baseball. So you need a coach that knows how to speak player, which is, hey, get your hand on the side of the ball or get out in front more or these basic cues, which is how baseball's always been taught. But you need that coach to be able to understand the data so he's giving the player the correct cue to make the desired change. What you have right now is a lot of coaches that don't understand the data and they're scared of it. And so they continue to coach the player based on what they know which might not be the best way forward for that player. And the front offices get frustrated because like, well, we're telling you to do this direction and you're taking in this direction. Why? And so that interpreter that understands the data and then can translate that data into an actionable step for an athlete is the new arms race. Teams are gobbling those people up uh, right now to try to bridge that gap so that they can make the informed decisions that they're making in the front office and actually see them play out on the field. Interesting. Interesting. Can you talk about some of these technologies? Like what information does Rapsodo give you and, and Blast? And... Yeah. yeah. So Rapsodo, I know the, I know the pitching side of things way better than the hitting side. Um, so I'll touch on the hitting side really briefly and then I'll dive into the pitching side. Stuff like Blast Motion might give you uh, your swing speed or your approach angle of the bat into the zone. Uh, we know that pitches generally approach the zone at a certain, um, uh, incline or there's a certain range by which they're generally approaching the zone. So you want your bat to be able to match that plane to give yourself the best opportunity to square the ball up. Uh, so blast motion can do some stuff like that, measure bat speed. KVest can give you really rough biomechanics on the sequencing of your hips and your and your torso. So is your swing mechan are your swing mechanics in the right sequence, stuff like that. On the pitching side, uh, Rapsodo will get it's a computer vision algorithm of some of some sort. So it takes pictures of the ball in flight runs through the algorithm and is able to um, decipher or predict the axis that the ball is spinning around. Uh, so now you know the spin axis, you can tell the spin rate and it has a radar gun in it so you have the velocity. So it measures certain things and then it, through, putting it through algorithms, it calculates other things. So the output might be spin direction, spin efficiency, spin rate, velocity, movement, um, location in, in the zone, some of these different things. Uh, some of them are measured directly, some of them are calculated. Uh, the power of, um, oh, TrackMan is, a, is an 
it's a Doppler radar system, so it measures other things directly and calculates certain ones. So TrackMan is very good at measuring the actual movement of the ball because that's what it's set up to do. It's not very good at measuring how the ball is actually spinning in the air. It can measure how fast it's spinning, but not the axis it's spinning around. So you have some of these technologies that measure certain things and calculate others, and then other technologies that measure certain things and calculate different ones. There's no technology out there yet that measures everything directly. And that's really where we need to get to because when you start jumping into some of the really complicated fluid dynamics that go on with a baseball in the air, there's no none of the formulas right now model for that. So you might have pitches that are moving a lot. Like let's say, okay, here's a, here's a really good example. A two-seam fastball sometimes can have a laminar flow uh, effect on it, like an aerodynamic effect where it'll jump one way or the other. So TrackMan can measure accurately when that ball jumps and, and how it moves. So it might say that that ball moves X amount, so it back calculates how the ball must have been spinning, and so it must be spinning this way to move that amount. Well, if you measure that same exact pitch on Rapsodo, it says that the ball was spinning more like this, and it says it moved way less because it's calculating the movement. And so you, you don't get a really good sense for how the seam orientation of the ball affects the ultimate movement until you get a system that's all optical based that can directly measure movement and spin axis and seam orientation and spin rate and all the direct measurables that you need to then create new formulas for how the how the weather affects the ball, how the, uh, the spin axis, seam orientation, velocity, release height, different stuff like that affect the ball. Uh, so this is, this is some of the exciting stuff that's being developed that hopefully we get to in the next five, 10 years maybe. So not just uh, our programming and that we need we need to take more physics courses it sounds like yeah and computer vision uh okay. is a i know that i know the computer vision has been around for a while and we're starting to get to a point where it's somewhat reliable and being utilized quite a bit um in ai technology and whatnot but when someone figures out that technology for baseball they're going to monopolize the entire measurable industry um so i'm actually <laughs> trying to develop it currently, but uh, who knows if I'll get there before someone else does or not. That's cool. So that, so that when we talk about technologies on the horizon, that's, that's where you see it going. Something that can, can basically measure everything through, through, through essentially video. Video. Yeah. Um, that's one of them is the, the measuring of the pitches and, and um, how the ball is traveling in the air and, and whatnot. The other part of that though, is biomechanics. No one understands why certain plays happen on the field from a physical standpoint. Why is this, <clears throat> why is the shortstop able to have a quicker first step than the other guy? Is it the angles that he's getting into on his pre-pitch step? Is it his, you know, what, what is it? No one knows because uh, we haven't been able to measure biomechanics um, of pitchers. You know, why do pitchers get hurt? Maybe we can see after pitch 60 that this pitcher's biomechanics change drastically and he's at a higher injury risk. Or maybe this pitcher can go 140 pitches before his biomechanics change. Why did this swing create a home run, and on the same pitch you missed this swing, or you missed this this ball? Why do hitters go through two or three week slumps where they feel fine, but they're not connecting? You know, is it a biomechanical thing? Is it a small little thing, or is it an eyesight thing? No one knows because uh, no one's been able to measure that. So finding ways to, and for those who don't know, biomechanics are very accurately measured if you put dots, uh, reflective dots on your body, and you can get with you know, like sub millimeter accuracy on those biomechanics reports, but you can't do that in a game, obviously. So in a game, you can measure via video and use a control cube to um, calculate the biomechanics, but the margin of error is a lot higher because a, a person is having to go through and click each joint center, and you can't tell from a 2D video where the joint center is a lot of times. So you get higher intent biomechanics but you don't get as accurate but when computer vision comes in and can take you know let's say 10 different cameras that are around you and put them all into one ecosystem now you know <clears throat> exactly where the joint center is so you can start zeroing in on the accuracy and get in-game metrics another thing is is hitter vision no one knows what a hitter actually picks up uh, is do they pick up spin can they use spin do they pick up trajectory uh, why, what makes a pitcher deceptive? Is it that something's flashing in front of the hitter's uh, vision, you know, where he's looking? And 
do all hitters look at the same place or do some hitters look at different places? Uh, so like that's a completely untapped area as well. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of really exciting <laughs> frontiers still left in baseball. What about the Moda sleep? That's something that, 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 that they're trying to use to um, predict injury and, and, and workload. Yeah. So actually drive on just acquired Modus. Um, and they're using that technology to rewrite uh, rehab programs. So rehab programs right now are based on, uh, you know, throw 10 throws at 60 feet, then throw five throws at 70 feet or whatever. But a throw at 60 feet for one person is drastically different than a throw at 60 feet for someone else. It might be 100 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour, right? but you're still throwing at 60 feet. So right now you're satisfying the work, the, the rehab program. So what they're trying to do with MODIS is take the intensity of that throw and say, we're not going to worry about the distance or anything, but you're going to maintain this range of intensities today, and then we'll bump it up a little bit, and we'll bump it up a little bit. And so MODIS, yeah, they put a sensor in your in a sleeve that's on your arm, basically, or multiple sensors. I'm not sure exactly. I wore MODIS sleeve years ago. I don't know exactly where the technology sits currently. But uh, they're basically trying to measure uh, stress on the arm and and find a way to quantify what that is and then give an overall volume and workload number that quantifies how how your throwing session was right and then when you get enough data there you can study who gets injured and who doesn't and try to correlate it with data yeah. and yeah i mean for, for injury for injury that's great to, you know that's that's one of the best um applications for it but what about wearing it during a game or and then every day in throwing to figure out when do, when i have my best games what was my throwing workload like leading up to that how do we optimize performance using it that's something i try to do so i measure Every single day, I have a spreadsheet that uh, I've been collecting data for two and a half years now. Uh, there's over 50 daily metrics that I collect on myself. That's from uh, amount of throws to the number of hard throws, grip strength, uh, jump height on force plates, weight, uh, blood markers, uh, sleep quality, all these different things. And so I have my analysts go through all the time and look at what correlates to good outings. First off, how do we define what a good outing is or what readiness is? And then let's look at you know, what puts me in the best spot to have that good outing. When do I lift? How much do I lift? How intense is it? When do I throw? How much? How intense? Like, when do I eat? What do I eat? How do I sleep? When do I sleep? All these different things. Um, so I have this massive data set of, of stuff that we're trying to, to run right now, which is why uh, I've said a lot in the past that I would be better on pitching every fourth day instead of every fifth. Uh, but that's all based on the data that I collect. My body peaks in readiness on day four, uh, not day five. Hmm. So I've heard I've heard yeah. that I've heard you say that before that that I didn't realize where the source was. That's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> let's get into some game uh, or MLB discussion. Um, you know, we, we hear a lot about increasing length of games um, yep. as a player. Does it seem to be an issue And you know, what could or should the MLB do to speed up games? Uh, it does seem to be an issue. Uh, we all, you know, starting pitchers, I think, get it the worst because we, we sit there four games out of five. Uh, and mm. I feel like I've been here forever. It's only the fourth. What time is it? Oh, we're two hours in. Great. You know, we all we all have those conversations. Um, so it definitely is an issue. Now, how you speed it up is is a question uh, that, you know, a lot of people are, are trying to solve. I think one of the things that it starts with is just, like, keep the hitter in the box, keep the pitcher on the mound. You know, let's let's just increase the frequency by which we're throwing pitches. Uh, the problem with that is a lot of data has come out suggesting that longer times in between pitches are mutually beneficial. The pitcher is less likely to be injured um, and uh, and more likely to perform at his optimal state. Obviously, there's a certain tail off too, but there's a certain there's a peak uh, by which he's more optimally prepared, and the hitter. Um, is more optimally prepared if there's a certain rhythm to, to how often he's seeing pitches. You know, hitters don't like being sped up. If they're in the box and a pitcher's throwing already, it takes it, it jars them, and then the, they, they aren't as prepared. So this is one area where data is suggesting a slower game makes the athletes more prepared, but that makes it less interesting and, and whatnot for fans, and it slows the game down. So there's, there's not really a whole lot of uh, great ideas out there about – um, how to go about speeding the game up and, and making it more interesting. I, 
one of the ways that they're, you know, <laughs> I, I've, I've talked about foreign substance on the ball a lot. Uh, um, so if you put pine tar on your fingers, you throw a ball, the ball spins a lot faster. Uh, and we know that balls that spin faster have the potential to move more and hitters are not then as able to hit those because they have to deal with a wider range of movements. Uh, so if you want more balls in play, if you take away the foreign substance abuse in, in the league, the ball, every, you know, pitchers' spin rates and stuff will drop drastically, and hitters will have to deal with less overall movement, and they'll put more balls in play. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that would solve the kind of three true outcome um, thing. Mm-hmm. And, and we understand this now because we can, we can quantify how foreign substance affects the spin rate and the movement and the resulting yeah, that, the result. that you can show in the lab with the Rapsodo and stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, another one is... Uh, but oh, what about the I other just... side of um, hitters want you to have a good grip? Well, see, I, I don't use it. I routinely no, no, I don't mean it. you. I, I just mean pitchers. No, no. The batters no, sure, want but... the pitchers to have good grip, right? Sure, I think that's a false premise, though, because okay. I don't use it, and I routinely am towards the bottom end of the league and hit by pitch. So I think hitters just assume that, you know, because every time a pitcher drills a hitter on purpose, what do they say in the post-game report? Oh, it slipped. It didn't slip the vast majority of the time. It just, you you know, you hit the guy on purpose. That I mean, that happens a lot more often than what people give credit for. But every time it happens so that the pitcher doesn't get suspended, he can't say that it's on purpose. So he says, ah, it slipped. And so then hitters get the sense that, oh, the pitch slipped. Uh, and so I got hit, and I don't like that, so I want them to not have the pitch slip, so let's give them grip. When you ask a hitter, would you like to hit five more home runs every year? Uh, he says, absolutely. Right? But if you look at the metrics, if you drop spin rates uh, in the league by the 300 RPM that foreign substance adds, that's about what it correlates to. You know, hitters would hit more balls out of the yard. They would hit for a higher average, and they wouldn't change anything. They wouldn't have to do anything. You know, so I think it's just based on that one specifically is based on a false premise, in my opinion. I got it. But um, yeah, there's there's it's it's a good question going back to you know how to speed the game up. Um, I think for pitchers, it can create a huge competitive advantage if you do work quickly, uh, because I think the benefits of kind of getting the hitter out of his rhythm outweigh the detriments of going faster uh, from your physical preparedness. And then the, but... the argument about fielders being ready and 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 all that, although the fielding's so good in the MLB that maybe that's not that good an argument anymore. Yeah, uh, shifts are one that you know. There's a lot more. Um... Oh, that's what that's what I was going to say. Shifts are one because there's a lot less hits overall, right? So there's less action, but that leads to more outs, which would you would think would speed the game up. But the strike zone is huge. Hitters are now incentivized to not swing unless they can do damage on a pitch. If you, I, they've been playing uh, old games on, you know, because there's no season right now, so they've been playing old games on TV. And if you watch these strike zones, their strike zones are huge. A lot of a lot of balls that are clearly balls are being called strikes, but that incentivizes the hitter to swing the bat. Right now, hitters are incentivized to take or to hit a home run because that's what the data is showing. Uh, and the strike zones are getting so accurate, and especially t- talking about going to a robo strike zone hitters will then be incentivized to not swing because a ball that misses by an inch is a ball and that gives them a better chance of succeeding whereas before a ball that missed by an inch would be called a strike the vast majority of the time so hitters had more incentive to swing because there's more balls being called strikes and maybe all they can do is put that ball in play as opposed to put it over the fence sure and then but you know you can argue that the effectiveness of that strategy for sure Sure. Uh, i I would even argue that it's it is more effective to take that pitch and risk it being called a strike because your chances of hitting that pitch and doing something productive are lower but hitters don't like striking out especially looking and so the incentive even if they know the data the incentive is then oh i gotta protect i gotta swing at that pitch because it might be called a strike so you get more balls swung at which produces more balls in play which then speeds the game up um so yeah, I don't know. It's a there's a lot of different areas. I think if there was one good answer on how to do it that was good for everybody, it would already have been done. Oh, that's a good point. It's a good point. So we talked a little bit about rule changes, but uh, Bill James talks about how 
you know, for a long time in baseball, rules changed as players players got better, as equipment improved, and so on. But we really haven't seen that much change in the game. You know, in the in the late '60s, uh, the pitcher's mound was lowered, and the uh, DH was introduced in the '70s. And so, in some ways, we've treated the game sort of like it's this pristine thing. I- any any suggestions you have for things that the MLB might want to try? Oh, uh, no, I, I come down to the side of things that I think the game is great how it is. I think it's the most talented game that we've ever had. I think it's the fastest, the most exciting game that we've ever had. But I think the education about it is lacking. I think people who watch baseball are used to seeing baseball a certain way, you know, uh, bunts, balls in play, uh, you know, hits and trying to move guys over in this traditional kind of baseball um, game. In the last five or 10 years, front offices have gotten super smart about what is actually good and what is actually bad. And so they've optimized for to do what's good more often. And the fan education around that hasn't caught up yet, I think. Uh, so I would argue for educating the fans and the industry as a whole as to why the game is good first and see if then some of the concerns about being boring or slow or whatever the case is uh, are taken care of through the education. And then if not, then we can address some of those things. Um, You know, I've heard stuff like uh, you move the mound back or, um, you know, put pitch clocks on or or whatever the case is. I think that, you know, changing the fundamentals of the game are are probably not uh, the best way to go. Same, same argument with the, with the shift, you know, people want to outlaw the shift. It's like, well, that's not, just let the, let the industry correct. You know, the shift is a fairly recent thing. It seems like it's been around forever, right? But really only in the last five years have shifts been super implemented. Hitters haven't had a chance yet to retrain themselves to beat shifts. What will happen is uh, teams will shift, players will get tired of grounding into the shift and having hits taken away. And they'll see a wide open portion of the field and they'll say, I'm going to take my hits when they give them to me. I played with one of the best hitters in baseball for a long time, Michael Brantley. And every time someone tried to shift Michael Brantley, he would just dump a ball the other way, take his single. And then he'd do that two or three times in a series and the team would be like, oh, okay, it's not an accident. He's actually actively doing that. He has that skill set. We can't shift him. They'd unshift him. And then he'd go right back to pulling balls through the, through the four hole. Um, but hitters as a whole haven't had a chance to train themselves how to counteract this, you know. So I, I, I'm, I'm in favor of letting the game kind of self-correct itself and addressing some of the packaging problems with the game before the actual game. Hmm. Um, what recommendations do you have for students who might be interested in baseball analytics? Like what skill acquisition, things, things that uh, you'd recommend? Yeah. Yeah, so specializing in a certain area and being a self-starter are two of the biggest things. Um, a little bit about the baseball industry on the front office side, they have all the supply. Uh, and so demand is extremely high. Um, so that drives wages down, but it also drives competition way up. And so getting into a front office, you're going to work for very little. Uh, and you're going to compete for that job with a lot of really, really talented people. So if you know a lot about one specific area and you've been a self-starter, you've published your work, you've gotten it out there, you've uh, shown it off, you've shown that you've undertaken some studies and some um, that you're actively involved in trying to learn something, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. You're going to have a much better chance of winning that job than someone who knows a little bit about a lot of things and has kind of a generalized education about it and who hasn't been at posting a bunch of stuff about what he's doing and why, why it's important and whatnot. Those people generally don't get the jobs. You know, it's the, it's the people that know a lot about one specific area because teams can look out there and they can say, oh, I've never thought about something this way. I don't know if it's effective or not, but this person clearly knows a lot about it and uh, he's shown that he or she has shown that they're willing to go out there and do work and research something and be a self-starter. So if I hire them to do a job, I'm con- I'm 
convinced that they're going to be able to learn what I want them to do and also add value instead of me having to tell them what to do all the time. And that's really what people are looking for in the baseball industry right now. That sounds like good advice uh, just in general. So Trevor, um, you know, a lot of, lot of Reds fans in the class, uh, certainly students from all over, but uh, you know, what, you know, how are the Reds going to look going forward? Well, yeah, assuming that we have a baseball season this year, I think the Reds are going to be really good. Um, we were all really excited with the team that we had going into camp. You know, I've been parts of teams that are expected to lose. I've been parts of teams that are expected to win, and then teams that are expected to maybe compete for the postseason. I think this has the feel of a team that's expected to win uh, in the postseason. Uh, pitching staff, uh, we have a really dominant bullpen, a really good starting staff, projected to be one of, if not the best starting staffs in the big leagues. Uh, we All the acquisitions uh, from Shogo to Nick Cassianos, Moustakis, and, you know, the um, the year that uh, Aquino had at the end, you know, last year when he came up, like there's a lot of reasons to be excited about the offense and um, what we're going to be able to do as a team. So I hope I'm hoping baseball's back soon because we we all want to just to get out there and start playing because we think we have something pretty special. That's awesome, awesome. Um, what about just the last? Uh, what kind of plugs can you give for your? Uh, the, you're, you're putting out some. Pretty cool YouTube content. Uh, my son and I were watching uh, this afternoon before we got you on. Can you give a plug for some of that stuff? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we have, uh, I have my company Momentum that is kind of giving lifestyle content of baseball players across the league. Uh, they're at watch underscore Momentum on socials. Um, YouTube, search Momentum and you'll find them. My personal YouTube channel is Trevor Bauer. Uh, it's slightly different. I do breakdowns of at bats that I've been in, I, I do uh, fan questions and uh, sit downs with uh, people around the industry to try to give some inside information on uh, you know, what's going on during this time and the industry as a whole. Uh, so that's Trevor Bauer on YouTube and my socials are at Bauer Outage uh, across the board. So if you want to check it out, I post free, frequently about where all my content is. It all lives on trevorbauer.com as well. If you want to check out one centralized hub for everything, uh, trevorbauer.com is the place to go. Awesome, Trevor. This is this has been fantastic. Um, like I said, you know, it's a bummer not to have baseball going on, but this is certainly, uh, you know, hopefully a bright bright spot for some people uh, just to get a chance to talk baseball and especially the uh, what I think a lot of a lot of uh, our students find a very interesting part of the game. Yeah, absolutely. I can talk about it for for days on end. So thanks for having me on. It's been a it's been fun.